Human Resources Subcommittee is access to infant prenatal care. Representatives from the medical and health care fields are among the witnesses coming before Congressman Ted Weiss of New York and his colleagues. Because of the length of today's Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee hearing, we join this meeting in progress. Earlier, the Institute initiated a study about 15 months ago on how to draw pregnant women into prenatal care. We will soon issue a final report, and I want to end my statement with a couple of observations growing from this present study. First, we are finding that understanding the antecedents of poor prenatal care use is greatly aided by data from surveys of women who have experienced difficulty in securing timely care. The GAO survey just presented is a case in point. We've located over 20 such surveys, although they're of greatly varying quality and analytic sophistication. And in our report, we'll be presenting a sort of meta-analysis of their findings. In a particularly interesting study released within the past week, Dr. Gary Richwald and a team of researchers at the UCLA School of Public Health reported the results of a survey of the 251 women delivering during an 18-week period at LA County USC Women's Hospital, having had no prenatal care at all. Of the primary reasons reported by these women for their complete absence of care, 46% were economic, 33% were organizational, particularly difficulty in securing an appointment, and 17% were attitudinal, such as thought prenatal care was unnecessary. The investigators compiled extensive materials on financial and institutional barriers to care, which I recommend you review. Their data show clearly that particularly for this very high risk group, the maternity system is not operating in a way that eases entry into needed care. The barriers to care in this study and in many others are clearly based in the healthcare system and not in women's attitudes or knowledge. Over the last year, we have been informally reviewing problems of access around the country, such as those addressed this morning, and the myriad approaches being tried to increase early registration in care. Now, just as there are many barriers to care, so also are there many strategies to reduce them. We have classified remedial programs into six groups. First, those that emphasize removal of financial barriers, Second, those that accomplish basic increases in system capacity. Third, those directed mainly at significant institutional reform. Fourth, ones focused on active case finding and recruitment through such activities as street canvassing and telephone surveys. Fifth, programs that offer intensive social supports and counseling. Sixth, and finally, provision of incentives through a wide variety of mechanisms, including cash payments. At present, available data are being assembled and analyzed on about 30 programs that fit these categories. The complexity of the access problem no doubt means that in any given community, some or all of these approaches may be required. Our committee will be commenting on the relative importance and impact of each of these strategies and on a series of related issues. Let me conclude by saying that overall, we are more impressed with the impact of programs that remove financing and institutional barriers, for example, than those that employ traditional outreach activities to ease access. Although it may be cheaper, easier, and more glamorous to employ outreach workers or mount a community education campaign, the major barriers appear to be systematic and require changes at that level. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Brown. We look forward to that report. Dr. Havas. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Pelosi, and committee staff members. My name is Dr. Stephen Havas, and I am the Acting Commissioner for the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. I'm here today with Kathy Hess, who's head of the Policy Office of our Division of Family Health Services. And we're here to share with you our state's effort to identify and address barriers to prenatal care. In recent years, Massachusetts has made the reduction of low birth weight and infant mortality a major priority and has invested a large amount of resources toward this end, particularly to improve use of prenatal care by low income and uninsured women. A combination of new, expanded, and refocused initiatives has been supported by a mix of state and federal fundings. This substantial financial commitment arose from our analysis of statewide birth and death certificate data on prenatal care and infant deaths. In 1981, 83 percent of Massachusetts women who delivered babies received adequate prenatal care as measured by how early and how much care they received. 
1985, this figure had dropped to less than 79 percent. The rate of infant uh, deaths, which had been declining steadily, rose from 9.6 to 10.1 deaths for every 1,000 births between 1981 and 1982 and then decreased slightly uh, and in 1983, 84, and 85 was approximately nine deaths per thousand. Particularly alarming, however, was that in 1985 the black infant mortality rate uh, jumped substantially by almost 50 percent uh, and it rose to almost three times the rate for white babies. At the first indication of these very disturbing trends, the department took a number of steps. One was we convened a task force on prevention of low birth weight and infant mortality uh, to analyze uh, information and recommend strategies for improving the situation. The task force was chaired by former Surgeon General uh, Julius Richman. At the same time, we sought federal funding uh, to do a survey uh, to find out what the reasons for uh, lack of uh, receiving prenatal care services were and to test a variety of services to address the need. The Massachusetts Prenatal Care Survey, which was supported by a three-year grant, had as its primary objective to, to determine the various factors that uh, were responsible for women receiving inadequate or insufficient care. We did oversample women who had received inadequate care to try and particularly focus in on what the major problems were. In the one-third of women who received late, little, or no prenatal care, the following problems in order of frequency were identified. No one to care for other children, no health insurance, not enough money to pay for care, being unsure about wanting to be pregnant, fear of doctors and medical procedures, not wanting to think about being pregnant, having too many other problems to go for care, having, to, having no way to get to a care site, not knowing the person was pregnant, uh, and it went on from there. These problems are somewhat similar to those that were found in the GAO report. The data indicated that these women often encountered multiple problems in uh, obtaining prenatal care, and in fact, on the average, had 2.6 problems, those who did receive inadequate care. The findings from this survey are now being used to design and implement demonstration projects in four target communities and also to uh, implement recommendations from the task force that I alluded to earlier. The task force presented a comprehensive set of recommendations in five areas uh, with a strong emphasis on improving access to comprehensive prenatal care and overcoming financial barriers to care. The task force noted that there was a need for increased financial assistance to solve some of the problems that had been identified, but also suggested that there were a number of states the, stat the state could take to uh, overcome these problems. And in response, the state did the following things. One, we amended insurance uh, statutes to eliminate exclusion of maternity benefits. Two, Medicaid coverage was expanded. Uh, and three, we initiated a new state-funded program called Healthy Start uh, to provide maternity coverage for the remaining low-income uninsured women. To date, that program, which began in December of 85, has enrolled approximately 11,000 women. This program was designed to promote early and continuous use of comprehensive maternity care. The eligibility requirements were kept simple, uh, in income below 185 percent of the poverty line, and lack of insurance coverage were the main criteria. No resource tests were imposed. There's simple application forms uh, to be filled out, either at prenatal care sites or uh, one can do this over a toll-free telephone number. And then once enrolled, women retain their eligibility until 60 days after delivery. We have staff to provide assistance uh, to people in this program and also a lot of uh, community outreach and educational efforts to get people into the program. Uh, in addition, Massachusetts now within the last year has uh, made the Medicaid program uh, available to all pregnant women uh, with incomes below the poverty level. That's an update on the findings that you heard from uh, the GAO uh, finding. Uh, and there is no resource test and eligibility is retained throughout the postpartum period. Um, we're also currently working to see if uh, we can implement the new presumptive eligibility process. Evaluation of the Healthy Start program is currently underway, but we already have preliminary evidence of its success. Number one, the large numbers of women that have enrolled, which I alluded to earlier. Um, we're reaching large numbers of young, single, and minority women, um, and one in five of the women being enrolled uh, speaks a language other than English. Uh, we have found, again, from preliminary data that, these, uh, that a higher proportion of uh, these women are receiving adequate prenatal care uh, compared to women without uh, such coverage. There were other recommendations which were made by the, um, the task force that I mentioned uh, to do community-based culturally uh, sensitive programs. Um, we've been trying to implement those recommendations in a number of the different projects that we've been uh, funding uh, in the current year. 
Uh, we have a number of innovative kinds of programs, uh, ones that provide a, a large amount of uh, community support, um, having uh, people that can speak uh, the languages of the, the clients being served, improvements in uh, transportation, uh, use of neighborhood homes for doing some of the education and referral services and so forth. Uh, details of that are in the uh, more extensive testimony. We've also in Massachusetts taken a number of other st uh, steps to try and reduce infant mortality and low birth weight. Uh, there's an increase in monies for family planning. Uh, state funding for the WIC program has been substantially increased in uh, recent years and also there's monies being, our money is being put into teen pregnancy prevention. Community coalitions have been funded in 12 different communities to again um, improve um, infant mortality uh, problems and uh, work on, on teen pregnancy problems. Massachusetts has made both a major financial commitment and a moral commitment to uh, dealing with this problem. State funding in fiscal year 87 approached 30 million dollars but much more remains to be done. There are many more excellent proposals uh, for maternal and infant care projects than available dollars. Federal MCH support has not kept pace with the need or with inflation. We don't have a means currently for replicating successful demonstration projects because we don't have sufficient funds. And Massachusetts has one of the strongest economies in the nation. Many other states are in a much worse position than ours and don't have the ability to fund the kinds of projects we've been funding. The federal government must join the states in a moral commitment to women ch and children and provide both leadership and financial resources. The financial barriers to prenatal care clearly must be eliminated. As our survey data also pointed out, women obtaining latent and sufficient prenatal care are more likely to be poor, single and young, have stress-filled lives, fear of medical providers and procedures, unplanned pregnancies, and lack of social support. Intensive community-based outreach, non-traditional educational approaches, personal attention, case management, and other forms of support are required before, during, and after pregnancy. Resources for the development and maintenance of such innovative strategies are critical. The economic, social, and human costs to government, women, and unborn children will continue to mount until women receive the care and support we know they need. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Uh, Dr. Johnson, uh, let me ask you. Uh, I'd like to get a better idea of the number of pregnant women who do not have health insurance or Medicaid. Uh, for example, at the 100% of poverty level or below, how many pregnant women in New York or Texas would need to pay for prenatal care themselves? Uh, the answer uh, is easier for Texas than it is for New York. Um, for Texas, um, it's uh, in round numbers 57,000 women who are at 100% of uh, poverty or below and do not have either insurance uh, or Medicaid. For New York, the uh, figure that we have is 8,500, again in round numbers, uh, but this excludes New York City and uh, only applies to outstate New York. Now why do you think there would be such a big difference between those two states? Well, the um, need levels depend upon three things, basically the uh, number of poor women in your population who are having infants, uh, the extent of, of insurance coverage within the, the state, and then thirdly, the uh, eligibility cutoff for Medicaid. And in Texas, it happens to be 35% of poverty. Now, in order to substantially improve access to prenatal care and thereby decrease infant mortality and low birth weight, what would you recommend as changes in eligibility for Medicaid? Well, I think looking at the figures, uh, if you're asking me what would be my wish, uh, it would be to take it to 185% of poverty for eligibility for pregnant women under Medicaid. And I, I think uh, it would help states leverage the dollars. There's something that, that I would not want to be missed here, and, I, and Massachusetts makes a good case for this. The states are really trying. They, they have a, uh, a lot of efforts out there. And in many ways, they're, that's where the leadership is coming from. And uh, they need some help. And if, if federal dollars were there to leverage their dollars, I think uh, most of this need could be taken care of. Uh, how many w women would uh, either 185% of poverty level or below or free prenatal care uh, be included in the system who currently have no insurance or, me, or Well, Medicaid. across these 10 states, at least, it would be about 250,000. And 
And I assume that uh, you, and you've already indicated that this would be a cost-effective strategy. Is that right? Oh, indeed. I think all the evidence uh, points in that direction. Do you, do you have any numbers to indicate what the total amount of, uh, of savings or costs would be? Well, uh, I think it's probably, I think I would rather defer an answer on that and, and give you a more detailed answer. It's not something If you'd submit it for the record, we'd appreciate yeah, it. Now, your research makes a major contribution to our understanding of the needs of poor pregnant women. Are there any other studies like it? Uh, there are other efforts to do similar, uh, to arrive at similar uh, information. I think what's special about this is that uh, w having information on actual pregnancy cases and information about how they paid for their prenatal care, that's relatively unique as a source of information. And that's, that's what's special about the study, I would say. Mm -hmm. Ms. Brown, uh do you agree with Dr. Johnson about the cost effectiveness of prenatal care? And do you have any additional estimates? Well, as you've heard a number of times this morning, the Institute made a cost effectiveness estimate a few years ago, this $3.38 saved and so forth. We have done no further calculations. However, because of the experience of going through those estimates, I, I read and look and am att and attentive to other estimates. I think ours is one of the lowest. As someone said earlier, it's a very conservative estimate. Uh, there are a number of studies of cost effectiveness of prenatal care. The findings range quite a bit, but they're all on that side of the fence. I think that's the key issue. Which assumptions you build into it, how far out you spend the cost, whether it's one year of life, which is what we did mm -hmm. for the infant, or five years or into 10 years when you get school age costs and so forth, those change the figures. But the important point is that all of the studies agree that it is cost effective. The magnitude, however, varies across the studies. Mm -hmm. There have been some increases in funding for the Maternal and Child Health Services Block Grant in the 1980s, but we have very little information about how the money is actually spent on prenatal services. Is this lack of accountability a problem? Well, I think it is. I think that one of the consequences of the creation of the block grant was that the reporting requirements at the state level were reduced significantly. It is not easy to gain information from individual states on what they're doing with the funds, either in a sort of a fiscal sense, a, a balance sheet, or in a programmatic sense. And those of us who are interested in this field spend hours and hours on the telephone calling our friends and former colleagues around the country to find out what's going on. It's a very time-consuming and inefficient way to gain a picture of the national effort in this area. Um, I don't think a week goes by when someone doesn't say, well, have you heard about what they're doing in Fargo? Or you know, what about Denver? Uh, there is no federal effort to survey systematically and make readily available to all interested parties uh, how those funds are being used, especially in the programmatic area. Thank you very much. Ms. Pelosi? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, forgive me, I have it two hearings at one time, right. so I have I to know. go back and forth. So if um, the clarification that I'm asking has been gone over, I beg your indulgence. Uh, we're all aware of the Surgeon General's goal of, nine, uh, of prenatal care in the first trimester. As a practical matter, frequently people are well into the first trimester before they even know that they're into the first trimester. And so it begs the question to me of how we can, uh, what we're talking about today is the most important kind of care, health, a healthy start. But uh, if we had a system of health care in our country where people would all be taken, have uh, access to health care, and then in the event that they found themselves in the first trimester, those valuable first, say, six, seven weeks, the first half anyway of the first trimester, which are so valuable to the development of the baby, um, they would be cared for. I think that it's, uh, I, I don't envy you the task of identifying, seeking out, or, or getting people to come in for help, because frequently they don't even know that they are in the situation that they are in. Uh, so I see that as a major um, obstacle uh, to, to
to it, and as I say, it just, it just uh, what makes me want to comment that, again, every, every sign points to we must do something, both private and public combined, to make sure that all of our citizens are healthy and able to, to deal uh, in a healthy way with all of the opportunities that come their way, especially a brand new baby. If you have already answered this, please um, just, I'll, I'll refer to the record, but do you think that the Surgeon General's goal will be met? We start with Dr. Johnson. Um, there were several goals outlined. Uh, the, the meant was that, that, um, that, what, that in what, regard uh, to visits? In terms of the first trimester. I think it's possible. Um, the um, one thing that steps being taken in furtherance of that goal to, to reach indeed, that. Indeed, I think I think that we may be taking a positive step today uh, in regard to the furtherance of that goal uh, by uh, highlighting the issue and so forth. And I uh, is it likely, given the current state of affairs, that that would be attained? I think it's very unlikely. Well, the, the department itself recently completed a mid-course review of the 1990 objectives and themselves admitted that attaining the early trimester prenatal care starts is not likely to be obtained. Of all the goals in the pregnancy and maternity area, I think that one is the looking, looking the most stagnant and the least likely to be reached. And that's, that's by the department estimates, let alone what we might conclude. What do you see as the major obstacles in reaching that goal? And forgive me if you've already gone over this material. Well, you're right that that's really been the major theme this morning is why are we not getting more women into prenatal care. The, the GAO, I thought, made an important point, which is that barriers vary by communities and they vary by individual women. The factors that, that seem to make a teenager less inclined to register for prenatal care may be different for an older woman with several children. So there are variations among communities and among groups of women within same communities. But these themes of financial barriers, of problems in system capacity, of problems in securing a provider to uh, provide care are common themes across the country. And it's at that level, I think, that most people feel and have evidence to support that remedial actions need to occur. And so m much of the burden to reach the goal should not, it, it cannot rest on this say, teenage uh, mother to be if the record shows that that is, uh, so it, we have to be more aggressive and uh, Yes. And, and I, I did want to respond very briefly to your comment about knowledge of pregnancy. You know, what are we to do with women who may not recognize that they're pregnant until late in the pregnancy? You're right, there is a problem in that area, but I think it masks some basic system problems. For example, the links between pregnancy testing services and those that provide prenatal care are often very poor. If a woman, a teenager, is able to get to a clinic to secure a, pre a pregnancy test, and those are widely available, for example, in Planned Parenthood clinics and health departments, if the test is positive and the woman chooses to continue the pregnancy, the link to get her immediately into prenatal care is very poor. She may be given a phone number, please call such and such a clinic. For a young teenager in a highly stressed environment, simply giving a phone number is often not enough to secure prenatal care. So I'm not sure what this sort of knowledge of, of pregnancy and so forth really means. It may be a marker of difficulty in getting into care. It is not always intrapsychic factors within the woman, confusion and denial and so forth. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Pelosi. Uh, Ms. Brown, uh, you've testified about the inadequate federal response to the suggestions of the Institute of Medicine's 1985 report on preventing low birth weight. One of these suggestions was that the Division of Maternal and Child Health at HHS should help develop standards for public, publicly financed prenatal facilities. Has there been any progress on this? I didn't hear all of what you said. You wanted to focus on the standards of prenatal care? Well, you've made, you've made some recommendations. Uh, yes as to the, what could be done to prevent low birth weight. One of those that you made was that the Division of Maternal and Child Health Care at HHS should help develop standards for publicly financed pre prenatal facilities. And I'm wondering if you, if you noted any progress on this. Well, actually, I think that's one area in which there has been movement. I uh, mentioned it very briefly in my testimony. 
and that is the convening of the expert panel on the content of prenatal care. You see, what we really have here is a two-pronged problem. One is getting women in the door, into the doctor's office or into the clinic. The second issue, though, is what is done for them and with them once they're in the system. And one of the major conclusions of our 1985 effort was that where we have problems in both areas, we're not getting enough women in, and once they're in a system of care, particularly high-risk women, we don't have an adequate science base and often an adequate practice base to give them what they need. Mm -hmm. So we suggest that, that particularly for settings like a community health center that by definition addresses a very high-risk group, we need a much better and deeper understanding of what these women require to improve their chances of a healthy birth outcome. And it was in that context that we recommended standards and further work. I think this particular panel that is underway is a very positive step in that direction. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're now considering the standards, but they've not been, there have been no recommendations forthcoming and no standards set yet. That's correct, but I think there's good reason for that. Uh, prenatal care involves a huge number of interventions. It's a complicated area like much of medicine. And it is, it is hard to develop a clear understanding of what that care should include and of what in turn standards might include. There already exist simple standards. For example, the American College of OBGYN has pages and pages of guidelines on what obstetric care should include. The Select Panel for the Promotion of Child Health some years ago published a list of needed services that included a list of what obstetrical care should include. But to go beyond that and to get deeper into it, which is what's really needed, does take some careful work. So I think the fact that we don't yet have clear standards does not necessarily mean nothing is underway. Okay. Do you have any suggestions for us as to what Congress should do to improve federal response to your suggestions in that 1985 report? Well, I think the issue of leadership has been mentioned a number of times today, and I think it merits underscoring. Um, we need to attend nationally to this problem. And Congress, being a political body, I think is in a prime position to put this whole issue of prenatal care and infant mortality higher on the national agenda through hearings such as this, through specific legislative action, and so forth. More specifically, continued improvements in the Medicaid program are always important, although, again, I think the complexity, both legislatively and at the delivery site level, are, are absolutely overwhelming. And I think any way that we can make the program both broader and dramatically simpler will be a step in the right direction. And of course, continuing to fund the Maternal and Child Health Services Block Grant at an increased level is another uh, mechanism open. However, I think we all have to recognize that what we've got here is a patchwork sort of crazy quilt of programs. At the community level, it is very difficult to figure out how these various pieces fit together. And any effort to improve their coordination, to simplify their relationships, to build them together, is what I think over time is going to fix the problem, not incremental changes at the margin. Mm -hmm. In the uh, prepared testimony that the administration will be presenting later this morning, they suggest that financial barriers are less important than women's attitudes. Now, you've, you quote several studies, and you've indicated in your oral testimony, that show the opposite. What do you see as the major barriers that poor women face in obtaining adequate prenatal care? Well, I think we're all beginning to sound like a broken record. Uh, I think the evidence is clear, and it's actually quite uniform, that it is system-based characteristics such as presence or absence of insurance, capacity to find a provider or make an appointment that make the difference. Uh, it is true that there are multiple barriers that influence youth. I mean, use, rather. If you think of your own decisions to use or not use a particular service or enroll in a school or choose a play to go to, there are many factors that influence it. And we can't say there's only one, obviously. People don't work at that kind of simplistic level. But as you look across the studies, urban, rural, teenagers, older women, black, white, whatever, there is this constant bubbling to the surface of these issues of financing, insurance, available appointments, distance to travel to a provider, and so forth. It is also true, and I think particularly for young teenagers, 
that absence of information, ambivalence about the pregnancy and so forth are also there. But if we're looking from a public policy perspective about what we can affect, I'm not sure what we can do about ambivalence about a pregnancy. But I do know what we can do about absence of insurance. And in any event, the, that ambivalence, that attitude, is only a small percentage of the, of the total problem of access, lack of motivation or access. Across studies, that's true. But again, for particular populations, that often is important. And again, I would, I would highlight young teenagers. Mm -hmm. There was a very good study done in Hartford, Connecticut, just of adolescents. And it's one of the few studies we reviewed in which ambivalence about a pregnancy and fear of telling mom and those types of issues seem to preclude early enrollment in prenatal care. But that's one out of many. Thank you very much. Ms. Pelosi? Okay, thank you. Good, thank you. Uh, Dr. Havis, Massachusetts recently conducted a study of barriers to prenatal care within the state. And according to your testimony, lack of money or insurance, including several related problems such as lack of child care or transportation, was the most important barrier to prenatal care. Negative feelings about the pregnancy, such as not wanting to be pregnant or even think about being pregnant, were also an important barrier to care. So if I understand your results correctly, Many women with unplanned pregnancies are at, particular, are at particular risk for inadequate prenatal care. Is that right? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the end of your question. Many women with unplanned pregnancies, then, are at particular risk for inadequate prenatal care. That's correct. Our study found that, that financial barriers were very significant in terms of um, access to care. Overall, in our survey, almost a third of those interviewed indicated that one or more financial problems were a major problem in terms of their, their getting care. And for those um, who received inadequate care, it was almost 50 percent reported that financial uh, things, either not having enough money, not enough insurance, and so forth, were important. Um, in terms of our survey findings, almost 15 percent indicated uh, that they were unsure about wanting to be pregnant and another 12 percent uh, said that they did not want to think about being pregnant. Um, overall in the survey, it appears that about 40 percent of the pregnancies were unplanned, and this is particularly higher um, in the teen community, and we know those, those people um, have a, a problem in terms of access of care. So that's, that clearly is an issue that needs to be looked at. And as a result of that uh, finding, uh, the state has increased funding for family planning programs, is that, that correct? That's correct. We have increased by about $1 million this year, and in addition, uh, the governor has launched a $1.2 million teen pregnancy prevention initiative. Mm -hmm. In July, uh, Secretary Bowen asked Congress to consider legislation that would essentially shift $85 million in federal funds from family planning matching funds for states to prenatal services for states. I take it that your study results suggest that uh, this would not be a particularly helpful thing to do since both activities affect prenatal care. That's correct. We think, in fact, that, that more monies are needed for each of these services rather than trying to pit one against the other and shift from family planning monies to prenatal care. Uh, and in fact, since um, unwanted pregnancies and teen pregnancies in particular can have a serious impact on infant mortality, regardless of, of level of care, I think it's, it's particularly important that family planning monies and teenage pregnancy prevention projects not uh, receive inadequate funding. Right. Now, in their study of a small number of poor women served in Boston hospitals, GAO found that only about half received sufficient prenatal care. I believe that most of the GAO interviews in Boston were conducted in mid-1986, which should have included women in the Healthy Start program. Does that finding surprise you, or what would your comment on it? Well, I, I think the GAO study dealt with Medicaid women and not women in the, the Healthy Start uh, program, which would be a different population being served. Uh, the, the findings of uh, close to, I think, 49 percent is what he mentioned, uh, Medicaid mm -hmm. patients not receiving adequate care is consistent with earlier findings that we had uh, documented. Our statewide rates, we don't have them broken out from, uh, for Boston from several years before, indicated somewhere slightly over a third of Medicaid, um, only a third of, of uh, Medicaid recipients receiving adequate care. Part of our efforts uh, in Massachusetts have now been going to trying to do a lot of uh, outreach and education, 
educational efforts to get more of the Medicaid uh, population into care. Some of those are being tied to the Healthy Start efforts or as, or as an offshoot of that, uh, trying to get uh, more women in both programs in early for, for care. How did Massachusetts choose the 185 percent of poverty eligibility criteria for the Healthy Start program? And do you think that that level is a reasonable one for other states? I think it is reasonable. We did it largely to, um, to make things simplified, uh, to make it consistent with other programs such as the WIC program which has 185 percent of poverty uh, level as the uh, cutoff level. Um, that way, for example, w women who are enrolled in the WIC program um, and have been uh, determined to be income eligible can automatically be considered as being um, eligible for the Healthy Start uh, program. Because of a lot of advocacy that we should in fact increase it, we have in the, the last year, uh, as of July 1st, shifted to 200% of the uh, poverty level for the Healthy Start program. But I think in terms of simplifying the system for the rest of the country, I think it would be a great leap to just go to the 185%. Yeah. Uh, Expand, if you will, on the problem that you would have with uninsured women, totally uninsured women, and those who aren't on, on, on Medicaid. Uh, and what, what, what is the, the size of that problem in your state? Uh, how are you specifically dealing with it? And I guess incorporate into it, if you would, uh, we've had discussions, jail cited uh, Birmingham, uh, which has a, uh, a free program for uh, prenatal care so that people without insurance have a, have a place to go without being concerned about not having care at all. And given the testimony we've heard and that you yourself, I think, attest to of the savings that are implicit in providing the prenatal care, uh, why would states not be advised to go to that kind of program? Or is, is, is the Healthy Start program, in fact, a, a substitute or a, a, a proposal to do that kind of thing? Well, in fact, the, the Healthy Start program is for those that are not, uh, that are above the Medicaid um, eligibility cutoff that is now uh, set at 100 percent of uh, poverty level in the state. And formerly it was an additional 85 percent on top of that got covered. Now we've, we've as I mentioned, increased that to 200 percent. So that is, in effect, dealing with the uninsured uh, population that is not Medicaid eligible. We don't have exact numbers in terms of how many women that uh, is. We think it's somewhere around 6,000 women. That's what the estimates of the uh, task force on uh, uh, prevention of low birth weight and infant mortality estimated. Um, interestingly, that's also the number of women approximately that are being served annually by the uh, Healthy Start program. Why aren't other states doing it? I, it? It's difficult for me to answer for other states. I think part of it um, may simply be having to put up the initial amounts of money. Part of it may be lack of familiarity with some of the studies um, indicating the cost effectiveness of this kind of care. Part of it may be um, conservatism of some state legislatures, um, conservatism of some um, governors not wanting um, to provide additional funds for that. It's, it, I don't think there's any one answer as to why all states haven't uh, adopted this kind of program. Uh, is there anything before I excuse you with our thanks and appreciation, is there anything that, that any of you would like to add uh, at this point on the basis of the questions that have been asked or that haven't been asked? Ms. Brown? Just one comment on this substitution of family planning dollars for prenatal care. The evidence that unintended pregnancies, women who have unintended pregnancies, begin prenatal care later than women with intended pregnancies is clear. So if family planning is reduced, unintendedness increases, and it exacerbates the problem of late registration. Okay, thank you. Dr. Johnson? Yes, I would just add in regard to the issue of whether or not the barriers are economic or, or attitudinal or whatever, that there are, within the last year, there are at least five studies which have appeared, all having somewhat similar methodology in that they examined of women who had, for whatever reason, not received adequate care and queried them for reasons why. And uh, without exception, the most prominent single variable that is always there is inability to pay and lack of insurance. Good. Dr. Havis? 
I just like to reinforce the, the recommendations that were made earlier about increased uh, federal funding for certain efforts, particularly the maternal and child health grant. I think the concern about there not being enough accountability for those funds could be easily met by writing into the legislation strict reporting requirements for that. I think there is variability between states or among states in terms of how detailed they, they in fact report their accomplishments and I think that that would be a way of getting around that objection. Um, the other thing, if there were a way to federally mandate that all states um, fund uh, or provide Medicaid for uh, up to 100% of the poverty level, that would be very useful. Mm -hmm. Ms. Brown had uh, suggested this difficulty now of, of, of finding out what is going on around the country because of the the uh, failure of the federal government to require that information. And uh, the question I have of you, I guess, Dr. Harris, is would you consider that to be a, an added or, or difficult burden to carry, that is, of not only compiling for your own purposes but forwarding on to the, to the federal government uh, the, the evaluations of the various programs that you have? Absolutely not. I think it's totally appropriate. Um, and just for, for your information, I've previously testified um, before both the uh, House and the Senate on the Preventive Health Block Grant and have made the same recommendation that there be um, strict accountability built into that. I think that that was a, a major weakness of all the block grants. Good. Thank you very much, each of you. Uh, I think it's been an important uh, panel and we've received some very good information uh, from each of you. Thank you. Thank you. Our last panel will include Dr. Robert Helms, the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation at HHS, and he will be accompanied by Dr. Woody Cassell, Chief of Research and Training Service of the Services of the Division of Maternal and Child Health, and Dr. Ross Anthony, Associate Administrator for Program Development of the Healthcare Financing Administration. Dr. Kuntz, I think that perhaps you ought to identify yourself before we swear in each of you. I am chief of the uh, maternal and infant health branch in the division of maternal and child health with health Good. resources. Thank you. As, as we've indicated previously, our, our practice is to swear in all of our witnesses, so if you would each stand, please, and raise your right hand. Do you swear or from the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record indicate that each of our witnesses has answered in the affirmative. Uh, again, I want to thank all of you for joining us today, and Dr. Helms will begin with your testimony. Uh, if you could, uh, uh, let me continue the introductions, which you didn't complete. Uh, also, right. with Dr. Me. Helms, we, the, the, the system that we have is supposed to be a better one. The, the uh, amplification system, but it's sometimes difficult to, to know why or how. You have to bring it very close to you and speak right into the wider of the microphones. Okay, is that uh, yes, better? Yes, fine. All right, so I was saying I would like to continue the introductions that, uh, that uh, you started here. Uh, let me uh, ask Dr. Kessel to introduce himself and then uh, Ross Anthony. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. My name is Dr. Woody Kessel. I'm also with the Division of Maternal and Child Health in the Health Resources and Services Administration. Thank you. Um, I'm Ross Anthony, the <coughs> Associate Administrator for Program Development in HICFA. We, we also have uh, uh, Dr. Joel uh, Kleinman, an expert on a lot of these uh, statistics in the department, and Mr. Elmer Smith from the Healthcare Financing Administration, who is an authority on Medicare eligibility. Uh, let me say that we have brought these people because of the cross-cutting nature of this issue and the importance that we think, you know, the department uh, uh, gives to this issue. Uh, Dr. Holmes, if any of the other witnesses uh, 
have to testify, then we will swear them in at that point, all right? Right. And we will proceed at this point with your testimony. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I will submit my longer statement for the record if you Without that's objection, okay that with you, be entered and we we'll, would we'll like to cover a shorter statement. This morning I will discuss the Secretary's commitment to these uh, issues and review the steps taken to combat the problem. When Secretary Bowen joined the Department of Health and Human Services, he stated that, all the areas of, that of all the areas of the concern that he had, getting at the root causes of infant mortality was among his highest priorities. He directed the Department to focus attention on the health of our nation's mothers and children. He established major initiatives to reduce both infant mortality and teenage pregnancy. I am sure that you are aware of the facts and figures of infant mortality and morbidity. While the United States infant mortality rate has declined steadily throughout this century, the recent rate of decline has slowed. In 1986, the infant mortality rate was 10.4 deaths per thousand live births. For certain racial and ethnic groups and in some areas of the United States, infant mortality rates exceed the national rate and are more than double in the worst instances. The issues related to infant mortality and morbidity have proven to be complex ones. Despite substantial efforts by the health community and federal and state governments to accelerate its reduction. <coughs> Low birth weight is recognized as a key determinant of infant mortality and morbidity. In 1985, about 250,000 low birth weight infants were born in this country. Many of these very small babies suffer from long-term disabilities such as learning disabilities, cerebral palsy, re retardation, vision or hearing impairment, and they have a suspected increased rate of respiratory infections. A low birth weight baby places a tremendous emotional and financial burden on the family. The phenomenon of low birth weight is the subject of much research. And while the causes have not been completely identified, we do believe that early initiation of prenatal care is associated with, you, with reduced rates of low birth weight. And what is the solution to reducing low birth weight and consequently infant mortality and morbidity? The solution will require multiple strategies, but enhancing access to prenatal care is one of the Department of Health and Human Services' most important efforts. Prenatal care assesses a woman's risk of an adverse health outcome for herself and her baby and attempts to reduce or prevent the consequences associated with that risk. But the key is early diagnosis and treatment. While medical assessment and treatment are the predominant activities of prenatal care, early care also provides the opportunity to influence maternal behavior which affects the infant's health. The mother's use of cigarettes, drugs and alcohol and her nutritional status are clearly linked to low birth weight, prematurity and miscarriage. With information and counseling provided during prenatal care, these harmful behaviors often can be stopped or modified resulting in healthier mothers and babies. Unfortunately, high risk women are the least likely to receive early prenatal care. Despite substantial federal and state funding, Utilization of services has not improved for women in high-risk groups, and the frequency of late prenatal care, as well as no prenatal care, has actually increased over the past few years. We believe that it is our shared responsibility with states and local authorities to address this most important problem. But in my remaining time, I would like to look briefly at what the uh, administration has done to reduce infant mortality and morbidity, to increase utilization of prenatal care among low-income women, and then to discuss what we think should be done if we're going to make a substantial, uh, if we're going to make substantial fu future progress against this difficult problem. Our efforts include numerous service programs, research studies and data, and surveillance projects, uh, which address early enrollment in prenatal care, the quality and content of the care, and the barriers to receipt of care. And I, these are covered in more detail in my statement. Let me just say they include the uh, Maternal and Child Health Block Grant. Uh, in charts four and five of my testimony, you can see that maternal and child health expenditures have increased every year since 1981. In addition, we are targeting special efforts to identify at-risk uh, women, 
promote early and continuing prenatal care and address gaps in the prenatal service system. Uh, we've also got a major effort covered in the testimony on basic bio, biomedical and health services research. Uh, and the National Center for Health Statistics is working uh, and has actually made a good bit of improvement on a system to link data from birth and death records uh, in order to assist in effectively identifying high-risk populations. In addition, the Center for uh, Disease Control in Atlanta, using its surveillance expertise, has conducted special investigations with states to better identify high-risk pregnant women. And of course, uh, there's a Medicaid program uh, where we've made major changes in Medicaid eligibility. All of these efforts to enhance access of care have not been enough, however. The complexities related to prenatal care have not been effectively addressed. Medicaid women remain at very high risk of an adverse health outcome for themselves or their babies. We have learned that money alone may not produce good outcomes. Therefore, we need to focus on what services are needed and how to deliver these services. While affordability is a critical component of access to care, the how, what, and when services are delivered is far more important. For example, we know that individual and provider attitudes, experience, and behaviors have a strong impact on the pregnant woman's motivation and perceptions. Hospitals may be perceived to be intimidating. There may be cultural or language barriers. The importance of obtaining, obtaining prenatal care may not be well appreciated. Other barriers to receiving prenatal care have to do with availability of maternity care providers, provider participation, the prenatal care services themselves, the location, hours of operation, waiting lines, transportation uh, to and from the place of care, child care services, and the scope of outreach systems to recruit hard to reach women into care. As I have stated, the Secretary is personally committed to reducing the unacceptable high rates of low birth weight and infant mortality in the United States. To that end, the department is proposing the Infant Health Demonstration Act, a special program to test the effectiveness of providing case-managed comprehensive services, uh, medical, educational, nutritional, and uh, psychosocial, to pregnant women, including teenagers, at high risk of having low birth weight uh, infants. The Secretary's Infant Health Initiative grew out of demonstration projects and other research which indicated that money alone was not enough to markedly improve infant health. We believe that focusing resources, coordinating services, and working through a case manager approach to address infant mortality will yield positive results. The Secretary's Infant Health Initiative would create a program to demonstrate and evaluate innovative methods of providing targeted, case-managed, individualized, comprehensive services to Medicaid-eligible pregnant women and their infants through the first year of life. We intend to work closely with governors and state Medicaid and maternal and child health agencies to design, implement, and evaluate the effectiveness of innovative approaches to targeting care. Priority would be given to states with areas of high infant mortality that demonstrate a commitment to addressing the issues of high infant mortality and low birth weight among Medicaid-eligible women. Evaluation would be a critical component uh, since the purpose of the initiative is to find the right mix of services for reducing infant mortality and morbidity among high-risk groups. I wish to emphasize that the key to reducing infant mortality and low birth weight is not additional funding, but intervention strategies carefully targeted to high-risk areas aggressive outreach for case uh, finding, case management to assure appropriate referrals and continuity of care, standardized risk assessment, expanded patient education services, extensive follow-up, and active community participation in the design and implementation of interventions. We know that each of these key components contributes to reduce low birth weight, neonatal mortality, and post-neonatal mortality. What we don't know is the optimal set of program components necessary to affect these desired mortality and morbidity reductions for, at -risk, for the at-risk group. We believe that with your support, 
we can launch this initiative and take action where it is needed. Mr. Chairman, our children are our greatest national resource. The Secretary is committed to reducing infant mortality and morbidity, and we trust that our efforts are toward that end will be supported. Thank you. Dr. Helms, I assume that uh, your colleagues and associates will be available to respond to some of the questions, but they don't have independent testimony of their own. Is that correct? I, we here are, are available and Four there questions, are right. others. I, I didn't quite get your question. Okay. Uh, let me start off before asking questions by uh, telling you that I don't have any question at all about the commitment of Dr. Bowen and the sincerity of that commitment to try to reduce uh, levels of infant mortality uh, and care for, for infants, newly born infants. The problem we have is that uh, the suggestion that uh, all kinds of other approaches would be, should be taken but that money is the least of the problems uh, flies in the face of the testimony that we've received uh, and what all the studies that have been cited to us say. Yes, there are a complex of factors involved, but the biggest factor is the in inability of people, of women, to pay for the care. And it seems to me that until and unless that problem is addressed, all of the other efforts are going to be uh, certainly inadequate in dealing with the problem. Um, in 1984, 60,000 pregnant women received no prenatal care at all, and approximately 140,000 received no care until the last three months of pregnancy. Almost half of these women were unmarried, and these numbers seem to hold true for 1987 as well. The percentage of women receiving only third trimester, or no prenatal care at all, reached a low of 5.1% in 1979 and 1980 and rose to 5.6% in 1983 and 84, the same level as a decade earlier. The situation worsened in 26 states and Washington, D.C. between 1980 and 1984. Now, these are very discouraging trends. Uh, do you think they're related to the stricter Medicaid eligibility standards that were imposed in 1981, which resulted in many of the working poor being cut from Medicaid? Uh, well, it, it may have had uh, some effect. I don't, uh, but I do think this is a, a much broader problem that, uh, you know, it's, it's out there. I don't know that, uh, again, it gets back to your basic uh, statement before about will massive amounts of uh, insurance and coverage really do something uh, dramatic about this. I, I think uh, marginally they would help, but I, I guess our situation here is that we have looked at these demonstrations and the situation and we would like to go out there and try some demonstrations that get at some real intensive case management of the really high incidence areas where we know there are real problems. Let's go see what we can do with that and get good information about it. Uh, and we, we, from the research, we really think this will be an a productive approach. The, the problem that we have, you know, is that that might be acceptable, it seems to me, if uh, the administration was in its first or second year. We're now in the seventh year, almost finished seven years of this administration. And every indication is that the problems have gotten worse during the course of those seven years than they were when the administration came into office. It seems to me that it's a little late in the game for the administration to suggest that what we need now is some demonstration programs when in fact it's quite clear that, you know, the, that, that the, the approach taken by the administration has been a problem. And uh, I just... Uh, it seems to me that by the time you get through with, with your, never mind your three-year demonstration program, but one year of that, your administration is out of office. And uh, it is, I think, a, 
Okay. Well, we have a lot of faith in the next Republican administration. They can carry on with Well, this. I would like to think that whatever the administration is, that their record would be better than the last seven years of this administration. Well, let me point out, there have been a number of changes we think get it to the right problem uh, in, in Medicaid. There's a new, new eligibility standards and so on, and we'd like to see how these, uh, we think there's a, still a lot of potential, and we are working to get the word out. Uh, there's a lot of potential, I think, for covering a lot of the problem cases out there already. In July, as you've indicated, Secretary Bowen proposed legislation that would shift approximately $85 million from family planning matching funds to the new demonstration projects that address infant mortality, low birth weight, and related problems. Now, this ship was previously included in the President's proposed 1988 budget, but was not accepted by Congress. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Now, according to the Congressional Research Service, the so-called new activities that are described in this proposed legislation are already possible under current law. For example, Section 1915G of COBRA, passed April, in April of 1986, allows states to offer case management services as an optional Medicaid benefit. In fact, even Section 1915B of the Omnibus Reconciliation Act of 1981 allows the Secretary to waive certain Medicaid provisions in order to allow states to establish similar case management systems. I understand that South Carolina has used that authority to develop a program for high-risk pregnancies. That's, that's an accurate statement of the facts and the law, isn't it? Yes, and uh, we work very closely with South Carolina. Let me say that we think that this, what you're saying is, is largely true, and we've tried to take advantage of uh, the authorities that are already there, but what we're talking about is a more in intensified and targeted effort that we would like to, uh, to proceed with. Well, the fact is that, that the authority to do it has, in fact, existed since 1981. In 1986, under the uh, Reconciliation Act, Massachusetts and Minnesota had also taken advantage of that case management option. In your testimony, you list six other states that are planning to adopt case management services under current law. So can you explain to me what this bill offers that wasn't already available? Dr. Kessel? Mr. Chairman, I think the principal feature of this initiative is taking advantage of some of the issues that were raised by earlier witnesses, and that being the cooperation and the coordination of bringing the Medicaid programs, working more closely with the maternal and child health programs, providing the experience, disseminating the expertise to the local level in order to achieve the outreach and the continuous care that was cited earlier. Well, that's all very nice, but you know, no regulations were ever published by HICFA for the similar case management amendments that were included in the COBRA Reconciliation Act, which was passed in April of 1986. And these regulations have now been delayed for a year and a half. If the administration supports these kinds of projects enough to introduce such similar legislation, why weren't regulations published for them by now? Um, sir, um, th you're correct in stating the regulations have not been published, but in, in actual fact, these these particular provisions have been implemented through manual instructions and other directions. So uh, we are working on the regulations and we will try to get them out as soon as possible, but we have not delayed the implementation of the programs. And I think that's the important factor here, that the law that Congress put forward has been implemented and is going forward. Right. So again, either way, there is no need for the new legislation. It doesn't really add very much. Now, GAO expressed concerns about the presumptive eligibility amendments included in COBRA of 1986. Uh, the goal of these, those amendments were to enable pregnant women to qualify for Medicaid immediately if they appear to meet the eligibility criteria rather than having to wait for several weeks or months. Apparently, very few states are planning to take advantage of this option because of concerns about how it will work. In fact, one of our very first witnesses this morning uh, from Washington, D.C., indicated the problem that she had uh, because there was, there was not utilization of this presumptive eligibility and her inability to, uh, to manage the, the, uh, the system herself, and that if it were not for 
a doctor who was willing to do the work for her and provide the care, uh, she would not have received prenatal care. Now, how is HHS encouraging states to use this option, that is, the presumptive eligibility? Well, we are doing some things. And I'd, again, I'd like to ask Ross Anthony from the Healthcare okay. Finance Administration to, re to review some of these. Okay. Dr. Anthony? Um, yes, sir. Um, I have a, a survey or some, some results, I think, that were provided to you, too, that we, we have presently listed that 12 states have expressed an interest uh, in presumptive eligibility. So there are a number of states that have worked through the problems. Uh, that does not say that there isn't a, a great need to try to explain uh, the law and to help states work through the, the difficult problems that you have indicated. The Medicaid program, at best, is complicated and hard to understand. It's my understanding that we have a number of efforts underway to do that. Uh, the state Medicaid uh, directors and the, Medic and the Medicaid directors liaison committee, which works with us, has been meeting, as Ms. Brown indicated, we've been working on standards, uh, looking at data sets and, and other types of understanding uh, on an ongoing basis to try to, to promote this. Uh, I noticed that some of the recommendations, and I've only read the summary of the report I believe you, you received this morning, recommend uh, closer coordination and education efforts, and we'd be certainly glad to uh, proceed and try to see how we can improve that educational effort and work with the states in that area. Does uh, HHS have any plans to adopt new regulations or to improve uh, existing regulations so that this option, that is of presumptive eligibility, will in fact be used by more states? Um, checking with the expert, we do have instructions out, as I'd indicated earlier, on some of the other uh, issues. We believe that, that the law was clear and is self-implementing, um, and the instructions we feel are clear enough to enable the states to be able to put these uh, programs into effect. That doesn't mean that maybe we shouldn't do a better job at consulting with them and trying to explain them, and if there's a problem or states have a, a desire to have a, a closer cooperation or a desire to have better explanations, we'd be glad to provide those to them. Well, I would think that you'd want to take a very hard look because every indication that we get is that it is so confusing a situation that the states are unable or unwilling to participate because they don't know exactly where they will end up with reimbursement. Mm -hmm. I, um, I note your state is one of the 12 that I have listed here. Are you getting that type of feedback from them as they indicate that uh, by next year they will have a program in place? Have, have they come they've to you been, with the difficulty? They've been very slow in coming in because they don't really know what the attitude of the federal mm -hmm. government is. That's the let, problem that we face. Let me say that we also have uh, some programs with the National Governors Association and the Southern Governors Association to try to explain this thing. One other point I'd like to make is one of the uh, advantages of a case managed approach is that not only would these people be experts in trying to get at the risk factors and trying to change people's motivation and so on once they get them in, but these demonstrations would work to find uh, some of the hard-to-find at-risk people and get them involved. But another thing that they could do once they're working with these women is to tell them about their eligibility possibilities, uh, tell them about what their rights are under Medicaid and so on. It's well, a difficult problem, again, but I do think we're working on it. The question that we have, Dr. Helm, the problem that we have is that I, I would find it more easy to accept the suggestion that this new legislative approach or initiative that Dr. Bone has, has introduced uh, is, is uh, taken in, as, as a real effort if, in fact, we had had some indication that the prior authorization for case management, which goes back to 1981, had been implemented. And the fact is that it has not been. So uh, it, it leaves some question in my mind as to whether, in fact, this is a real attempt or whether, in fact, uh, it, it's something that's come out of the bureaucracy to try to suggest that there's a significant new approach when, in fact, it's nothing new at all. Uh, well, I guess I take some exception with that because I, I do think the Secretary is very sincere. I think he's looked at the situation. He says, you know, we can do more, and he's given us very uh, his own personal desires that he wants more done in this thing. But we are really looking at this thing in terms of trying to get to the, to the really problem areas, and we think that's what our initiative would do. Ms. Pelosi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is a 
obviously a very important issue and there's some very important questions that I have which I would like to uh, request unanimous consent to submit um, later but I without do without objection no. thank you mr. chairman the um, they relate to issues like um, if these programs do exist and the regs have not been written uh, what how are how is it all being how is it promulgated how do people know uh, some of the people in, in terms of the bureaucracy that has to deal with it in terms of the in delivery of service to individuals some of these people um, are the least able to deal with the bureaucracy uh, and uh, therefore uh, that creates an obstacle as well I also am uh, concerned about your statement that funds for this initiative would be uh, those previously budgeted for family planning I think that that's a very serious mistake of uh, that uh, the funds certainly should be available for prenatal care and we all agree on that but I think that our our approach to a healthy start if I may borrow Dr. Havas's term uh, involves a comprehensive look at how uh, when children are conceived and come into the world and I would hope that again we do not have a competition for the dollar <clears throat> talk about what is more important when it's all part of the very same thing so I will I do thank the witnesses for their testimony I will submit some questions and thank you mr. Chair. could I uh, Please, comment on that uh, about the funding the secretary has already indicated that if uh, people don't like uh, cutting that let me let me just say that it didn't come as a uh, an intent to cut family plan planning so much as it was uh, an overall policy to reduce enhanced matching rates across the board where they existed. We thought a lot of them were uh, had outlived their usefulness of the starting programs. But the Secretary has already indicated if you don't like that, he would welcome other suggestions of offsets to uh, his other ways to fund this. In your prepared testimony, Dr. Helms, uh, you said that quote, financing is not a ma major barrier to the reduction of infant mortality, close quote. And yet the General Accounting Office, the Children's Defense Fund, the Institute of Medicine, the Massachusetts study, and Dr. Johnson's research, which you've heard about today, all of which we've heard about today, all show that you're absolutely incorrect. Now on what evidence do you base your assumption that financial barriers are no longer a major problem? Well, I think to a certain extent they're expressing opinion. What I wouldn't know. Uh, they're, they're demonstrating I'm an, I'm an studies. Economist. They're not expressing opinions. They're, 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 uh, they've demonstrated by studies. Yes, I'm, uh, uh, be honest with you, not as familiar with all those studies, uh, but by training I'm uh, an economist. I can't deny that if you had uh, uh, massive amounts of money put into all kinds of insurance programs that you would have a marginal effect on this problem. Those figures what, were cited to us we, that if you spend $190 million, you'd cover the problem of uninsured women. Well, I don't know about that. But let me say that our intention is to get at what we think is the, the real problem here of trying to concentrate on the real uh, worst areas of the country and the worst sort of at-risk groups that we can identify. We think a lot of work needs to be done and we are doing a good bit of analytical work to identify these people and try to go after these particular ones. Spreading a lot of money around I don't think has worked in the past and I don't think it'll work in the future. Well again I, 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 I don't understand uh, where you're coming from with that. The every study, I mean one of our witnesses uh, uh, from the Institute of Medicine uh, said that we all sound like broken records because we're saying the same thing all of us over and over again which is that for every dollar spent on prenatal care within the first year you get back almost three and a half dollars in savings so I don't I don't see where on the basis of the administration's own cost benefit ratio which is what what uh, I thought was the bottom line approach of this administration, it makes sense not to spend the relatively modest amounts of money which come back in much greater amounts of immediate saving, not, not even counting what, what happens years out. Okay. You attempt, to, Dr. Helms, to place a lot of blame for the lack of prenatal care on poor women themselves. Uh, you mention their fear of hospitals, the fact they do not value health prevention measure, measures, and that they are poorly motivated. Now, although non-financial barriers are important, 
The research quoted by the General Accounting Office and the Children's Defense Fund find financial barriers to be more important than other barriers. Now, I don't know if you were here earlier to hear our first two witnesses, uh, who were excellent examples of women who very much wanted to obtain prenatal care, but lacked the money to get the care. Do you have research to back up your claim that women's attitudes towards care rather than the lack of affordability are the major reasons why they fail to obtain adequate prenatal care? <coughs> Dr. Kessel? Mr. Chairman, I think what we were suggesting was, as you pointed out, that there are indeed non-financial barriers to accessing care. And those are, as you identified, among the litany of the factors related to why some people don't seek care, even when there is financial uh, access to that care. Certainly affordability is a critical component, as has been stated uh, by Dr. Helms, and we're just emphasizing I think what Ms. Brown emphasized, what in, in order to really achieve success in improving the health of mothers and children, we have to be much more aggressive in terms of our programming and effective in our programming in order to make the dollars available more effective. Well, that, that's all nice language, but again, let me remind you of the question. Do you have research to back up your claim that women's attitudes towards care rather than lack of money are the major reason why they fail to obtain adequate prenatal care. Let, let me, uh, I, I don't want to give you data, but I have a summary. You don't want to answer that question I, either, I but to, you want to say something else, okay. No, <laughs> I'll try to answer with a GAO report. Yeah. And there are some statistics there that, that I find interesting. Uh, they say in the first three months of, uh, of a pregnancy, the uninsured, there are 24 percent of the uninsured don't receive care, 16 percent of those on Medicaid. And in the next paragraph in the summary I saw, those citing money as a barrier, 23 percent of the uninsured said that was a barrier, but only 10 percent of the Medicaid population. Um, 16 percent not receiving prenatal care is an unacceptable level from, from my point of view. But what I find interesting is that um, only 10 percent felt that money was the barrier. I spent about four years of my life admittedly overseas in the country of Nepal, dealing with maternal child care, setting up a, a small health project and a community health project uh, in the mountains there. And uh, people do need prenatal care, and I, I laud your efforts to, uh, to deal with this subject. But I think that the goal needs to be kept in mind, and that is to prevent infant mortality from occurring. And um, again, from a personal point of view, I had a child who, uh, as a matter of fact, was a low birth weight baby born in uh, Johns Hopkins Hospital uh, a couple of years ago. And what struck me uh, is the tragic number of other babies in there who actually were drug dependent because their mothers had been on drugs. There are a number of other factors, smoking, drugs, education, social economic factors, that I think it's important that we not forget. That doesn't mean that maternal child care is not an important component. But our opinion is <clears throat> that we need to take a look, a broad look at this problem and not just hone in on one specific area. Let, let me add, uh, Dr. Kessel has assured me that we can certainly give you uh, uh, a number of studies and a list of studies which uh, we think are the basis for, for going after a case managed approach. When you get down to it, I don't think we have any study that point? says that, that uh, Dr. Uh, Helms, can you cite the, that, those studies for me now? No, I cannot right uh, now. Dr. Kessel, uh, we can you will cite be, me those studies now? We will be glad to supply them. You know that they exist someplace, but you don't have them at hand. Is that right, Dr. Kessel? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Yes. I'm, and, um, but what I was about to say, I think you get down to the bottom line when you say, are these attitudinal things major compared to the economic ones? I don't think you will ever. Uh, get a definitive study other than a lot of opinion polls about that. that well, that as a matter of fact, the studies which have been cited to us this morning are, it seems to me, pretty scientific and very detailed studies. And they're not opinions. What I sense is that what you're telling us is opinion, and you're trying to pass yours off as, as scientific conclusions and the scientific stu uh, studies that were made by the other people as, as opinions. Uh, I don't know if you heard Dr. Johnson's testimony regarding the large number of poor pregnant women who have no health insurance or Medicaid coverage. Does the administration support new efforts to make Medicaid or health insurance more easily available to poor women? 
particularly the poor, the working poor, who currently tend to be uninsured? For example, would you support making Medicaid available for more pregnant women? Uh, and to a certain extent, uh, we view that our initiative is designed to go after the, uh, the problem people, the high-risk people in the Medicaid population. We have also launched and encouraged a number of uh, uh, state innovative programs in our welfare reform effort. Uh, and there are some states uh, that are coming forward with some plans to uh, extend uh, Medicaid eligibility, and I think we're going to be looking at these uh, requests uh, very seriously. We're not, we're not opposed to, to some of these plans, uh, to considering them. Would you support making Medicaid available at a reasonable cost for uninsured women who earn too much to qualify for Medicaid under current regulations? Not at the present time. The 1985 Institute of Medicine report and earlier testimony today stresses the importance of family planning programs in improving birth weight and access to prenatal care. Yet Secretary Bowen's proposal cut the family planning matching funds to states, or would cut it, by $85 million, which is almost half. Shifting these funds around in this way is sort of like robbing Peter to pay Paul. I think I've already testify? covered that topic, Mr. Chairman. You have nothing to add to it. Well, the Secretary's already said that if you don't like that proposal, we'll be glad to consider any other offsets uh, which you might suggest. We're not uh, hung up on well, we, trying we, to cut we've that made, particular We've part. asked you just a moment ago about making it easier for people on Medicare, Medicaid to become eligible for coverage and making it easier for uninsured pregnant women to become more uh, easily available for coverage. And you said in the one instance that you're studying the Medicaid eligibility increase and that you're opposed to, the, uh, to getting uninsured pregnant women covered at this point. You're talking about a major change in the eligibility standards for AFDC and that and for Medicaid and that I think would be something we would have to look at very seriously. You're talking about a very extensive and expensive change in policy which has ramifications much larger than this particular population. What we're saying is we're doing everything we can under existing eligibility, under the existing rules to try to locate and encourage people who are eligible for the present benefits to come forward and get the kind of care that we think they need. But Dr. Helms, the problem is that the testimony that we've, we've received indicates that the expense, the additional cost for getting currently ineligible pregnant women covered is so modest. The range that we had was $190 million to $265 million at the outside. Uh, and the savings are so enormous by comparison, the very first year alone, uh, three and a half dollars for every dollar that would be spent, that it just seems to me that, that you're creating without having really looked at the facts and the studies. You're creating this aura and this fear of tremendously heavy costs when in fact all the, all the information indicates exactly the opposite. Not only would you be uh, saving additional lives or providing for healthier infants, but you would end up saving a tremendous amount of money. That's, that's what the facts seem to, or, or indicate. Well, let me say that I think uh, what you were asking about, would we be willing to sort of bend or change the rules having to do with the people who are not currently eligible for AFTC to open this up, people who work and have higher levels of income. As I think you well know, there are, I think, enormous opportunities to try to to do better in Medicaid for people who are, are much poorer than that. And we think that's where the problem is, and we think we'd like to concentrate more on that. In the President's fiscal year 1988 budget, the administration proposed to limit federal Medicaid expenditures. According to the Congressional Re Research Service, on an issue brief dated June 5 of 1987, States which had decided to provide optional Medicaid coverage to poor pregnant women under the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1986 would not receive federal matching payments for amounts expended in excess of the state capitation. Therefore, the administration proposal would have taken funds away from coverage for pregnant women. Now, this appears inconsistent with the administration's current concern with increasing prenatal care programs. 
Can you explain why the administration introduced one proposal to cut the funds and introduced another proposal that increases funds for the same type of services? Um, <clears throat> I think what you're referring to is the, uh, the cap proposal on Medicaid. And uh, uh, it's my understanding, and I will fully admit I'm not uh, acquainted with all the details, that, that the cap was set or was proposed to be set, but that the states had the flexibility within that constraint to allocate funds as they chose. So I'm not sure that, you know, I, I think you're correct in that a cap certainly limits funds, and uh, a state might wish to take those in some manner from a specific program, but I don't believe that we indicated we had to, you had to take them out of any particular place. Oh, that would have been the result of it. Yeah. In your testimony, Dr. Helms, you state that HHS has increased funding for maternal and child health every year since 1980. Now, what funds are included in Chart 5 of your testimony? I guess uh, all these things. Yeah. Okay, uh, Dr. Kessel tells me that these, in chart five, the maternal and infant health, it's only paternal and infant health figures there. The, uh, the infant mortality and low uh, birth weight uh, really indicates that uh, this started out at, in 1981, a total of 27 uh, million and rose to a well the rec in 87 112 million and a request in 88 of 197 million yeah. what i'd like to know is what do those figures uh you have a table on that chart uh running from 1981 through 1988 and the monies move up from 27 to 30 to 33 to 60 to 76 79 87 and finally in the proposed 1988 budget to $174. What? Tell me what monies are included in that. What? IH, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, these are research funds. Uh-huh, okay. Because the funds for maternal and child health services, the block grant, have not been increased every year. Uh, in addition, Congress appropriated more funds than HHS proposed for this program in fiscal years 1984 and 1985. In fact, the president proposed a substantial cut in 1984 and has proposed levels that don't keep up with inflation every year since then. When the funding levels are adjusted for inflation, the block grant funds for maternal and child health services have been considerably lower during the 1980s than in the 1970s or late 1960s. In their report, the GAO expressed concern about the inadequacy of these funding levels, especially in the South. Even with the federal deficit, wouldn't it make sense for HHS to propose increases in these funding levels given the data on the cost effectiveness of prenatal care. Yeah. We adopted a policy with the block grants to uh, overall uh, to maintain these funds at pretty much a, a level funding. Uh, with a great deal more flexibility for the states to operate within that. They have been at the level of uh, oh, about over 450, 457 million in 86 and 700 and uh, about almost 500 million in 87. Uh, we, uh, I'll admit, uh, uh, the secretary is uh, uh, not opposed to additional funding in this, but uh, we do have budget constraints in place on us just as you do on on yourselves Well, uh, the, the secretary is not opposed. Does that mean that the sec secretary now 
uh, supports the increased support for the program? I think he has made some, some efforts to get it up. Uh, and Does the administration now support the funding at the proposed uh, $557 million authorization level for fiscal 88? Now, we put in a budget request to tell me of 478, so we, uh, we support that. You don't support the 557, even though the Secretary is trying to persuade the administration to move to a higher figure than, than the 478, is that right? Well, I don't know that uh, this, I, this is correct to say the Secretary would really, uh, a certain amount. I, I think it's more accurate to say that he has supported the, uh, our budget request of uh, 478. Okay, so that that uh, which is an increase, and that's what I meant. He's he's uh, he does want to emphasize this, and I think that's why he was willing to increase the request. The 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 fact is then that the secretary does not propose the increase. Okay, uh, your prepared testimony uh, includes information on on many HHS programs that include prenatal services but little on how much is spent specifically on prenatal services. Earlier this morning, several witnesses expressed concerns that because block grant funds go to states with virtually no requirements, no accountability, we know very little about how much of the funds are spent on prenatal services and whether the programs are effective. Does HHS support greater accountability for these federal funds. I'm sorry, your final question? The, the question is, does HHS support greater accountability for the funds that are spent, the federal funds that are spent on, pre, on prenatal care? Well, again, we go back to, it was a basic premise of our block grant proposals to keep the re all kinds of reporting requirements on the state uh, to a minimum. I'm not, uh, as a researcher, I can't say that uh, having some more of this information wouldn't be valuable, but we think there might be other ways to get it, and we have certainly, I think, uh, can you elaborate? We have certainly supported some efforts to get, get some information. Dr. Kessel? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I think the basic principle was uh, also enumerated earlier, was in order to keep it simple, to keep the bureaucratic responsibility minimized, uh, that states should spend their time and attention in utilizing those resources to serve their population better. But certainly, uh, we've worked with them and they've shared with us uh, their statistics. Uh, we've supported a, a number of studies uh, in order to identify where there are problems and through technical assistance and other mechanisms, special projects, we've, we've worked with the states to try and identify uh, the information needed in order to focus and target the problems. I don't understand what that answer means uh, from the two of you. If, if in fact the information is shared with you, the statistics are shared with you in any event, then I don't see where there is the additional burden, the additional problem, or the additional cost if it's, if it's there already. The problem that was pointed out to us by all the witnesses earlier is that because there is no requirement, although you may get that information, I don't know whether you do or not. The fact is that it is not available to the people in the field or in the other states or localities, and there's no way for them to be able to gauge what programs are working elsewhere. And again, Dr. Holmes, you said as a researcher, you think that that kind of information is valuable. The, the states have no difficulty. I asked Dr. Havis, for example, would it be an additional burden on the states and would they, would they support having the requirement to submit that information as to how they spend their money? And uh, said no, in fact, he's testified on a number of occasions to make the programs more accountable, make the states more accountable. So I don't know why you would not want that information to be available, not just for your own private use, but for the use of everybody in the field. Well, again, it goes back to the basic uh uh, objective in the overall block th grant was to keep these reporting burdens down and we didn't want to do that through the block grant mechanism 
uh, not just in this program, but a lot of them. But there are other ways to get data, and we've supported a number of things in the Healthcare Financing Administration. And also, uh, say my office has even taken an interest in trying to promote this uh, idea of uh, in our research oversight activities of, of this research in the National Center for Health Statistics to get at matching up uh, the uh, uh, birth data with the death record so that we can identify and we've had substantial progress we can now get this stuff with uh, within 18 months now and it used to be something like 36 months so we made big improvement and we think this will help us a lot in our initiative in trying to find out exactly where the, the worst problems are The Maternal and Child Health Services Block Grant incorporates a number of programs for which the monies can be spent. Now, wouldn't you think that, the, that it would be helpful to the department to know on a state-by-state -state basis how the states are breaking down the money, what they're spending it for? Wouldn't that be worthwhile and valuable information for you to have? Uh, I'm sure we'd get some use out of it, but we still object to requiring that. Uh, if we can figure out other ways to get it, fine. But if the states don't object to, object to giving it to you, why would you object to getting it? Then if they don't, they're giving it to us, right? No. I mean, if they, we're getting it. If well, they don't why, object well, to it... Do you publish it? Uh, Mr. Chairman, know. is part of Do you of publish it? Uh, there, there is a, a report compiled based on the report of intended expenditures which each state uh, submits to us uh, as part of the block grant responsibility. Those have been examined and collated uh, and they've been sent to the Congress for review in the past. Do you publish it? It's not officially published but it's disseminated upon request. Would you for our records uh, submit to the subcommittee copies of those reports for the last five years. We'd be happy to, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. In 1985, the Institute of, Medicine's rec recommended, Institute of Medicine recommended that the federal government should take more of a leadership role in setting standards of care in federally subsidized prenatal programs. Has HHS done uh, anything toward this goal? And what if, what if has been done by HHS? Yes, I'd like Dr. Kessel because I think we have done some things here. Dr. Kessel? Uh, Mr. Chairman, as Ms. Brown mentioned earlier, uh, we did initiate a public health service expert panel to review the content of prenatal care uh, and make recommendations. Uh, as I'm sure you're aware, um, uh, the policy of the department is not to per se set standards but promulgate those standards set by the professional organizations and in this particular case it would be the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Uh, on the other hand what we have done is uh, initiated uh, some initiatives working with the states to compile um, I think what Ms. Brown referred to as uh, the minimum standards. Uh, Dr. Kuntz I think can explain a little bit more about what we're doing in that area. Dr. Kuntz? I think it was mentioned earlier by one of the witnesses about the uh, Maternal Child Health Medicaid Program Director's Liaison Committee that has been meeting since the early spring on a periodic basis. As part of the uh, interest of that group, one of their first efforts has been to focus on standards or guidelines more specifically around, uh, surrounding perinatal services. They have um, in, in the course of this activity, they have solicited, um, collected standards from um, as many states as have been willing to volunteer or send those standards forward, and they're in the process of collating them, examining, examining them, and discussing what they would, how those would be useful in their respective state programs. Uh, when do you expect the uh, panel's work to be concluded? And what do you expect the uh, ultimate result to be? Do you expect a, a set of recommendations to be forthcoming from the panel? I would just like to clarify that this is a voluntary group, um, and they, it is not a task force, so there's no defined time period associated with this. 
they they are doing this uh, coming together to try to enhance the collaborative and mutual efforts that can be uh, obtained through the Medicaid and MCH programs in in the states and so they have not set a specific time frame for the ultimate completion I think that uh, part of their uh, thoughts at the moment re that they will consider these in draft and for consideration for guidelines not absolute um, standards they do uh, um, tend to rely on the standards of the professional organizations as, as uh, those that are ones promulgated so that you you can tell us at this point when they will complete their work they um, are considering some draft guidelines at this at this moment since that is a group that I mean they would have to advise us about when they would that when they feel that that work will be complete or at a stage right. you don't know it at this point I don't right. know what that time okay. frame is uh, Mr. No. Chairman I might add that the work of the expert panel um, which is chaired uh, by Dr. Mortimer Rosen from uh, uh, Columbia University uh, in reviewing the content of prenatal care should be ready by the fall um, of 1988 after it's, uh, uh, they finish their deliberations. Uh, I might uh, as well point out that um, much of the literature tends to focus on the medical content of prenatal care uh, and does not have, is not very rich in terms of the evaluation uh, of the behavioral aspects, the psychosocial care, although those are very important uh, issues. What I'm referring to here is the interventions to precisely respond to those problems uh, in uh, the women that we're concerned about improving their health and their pregnancy outcomes. An HHS-funded study by the National Bureau of Economic Research found that early prenatal care is even more important for preventing low birth weight and infant mortality for blacks than for whites. So it seems that prenatal care could be extremely important in elim eliminating the enormous racial difference in infant mortality. Uh, Dr. Helms, are you familiar with that study? No, I'm not. Okay. Dr. Kessel? I don't think specifically, sir. Uh, what is your opinion, Dr. Helms, of GAO's recommendation that HHS do more to disseminate the results of studies of prenatal programs that are funded by the Maternal and Child Health Services Block Grant every year? Uh, I think one of the objectives is to, is to improve. We have no objection to uh, trying to improve the dissemination of useful information. That's one of our objectives for our demonstration, to, again, to do the evaluation of these things, find out what really works, and try to disseminate that information uh, as well uh, as Has possible. there been a dissemination of uh, those studies, the results of the studies? Sure. You want to? Mr. Chairman, um, to the extent uh, we're working on that issue. We publish every year uh, the results of the uh, demonstration and research projects that uh, the Division of Maternal and Child Health uh, supports that sent around uh, to the state uh, maternal and child health directors and the other members of the uh, maternal and child health community. There are other procedures that we've engaged in to try and address this uh, more effectively through meetings, conferences, workshops, uh, technical assistance activities directly to the states. And I think Dr. Kuntz can elaborate a little bit further. Dr. Kuntz? We have several uh, projects that we are funding that are regional in nature and uh, are specifically uh, targeted to sharing of information among the states in the regions that are involved in the projects. Uh, for instance, in Region 4, there is a project that addresses uh, perinatal issues and the data and the kind of information and programming that should be uh, implemented. Uh, currently, one of their most um, uh, prior, highest priority er issues is to d 
develop an indicator for identifying unmet prenatal care usage. And that meeting was just held uh, last week in Chapel Hill. It involves both state maternal and child health officials as well as state vital registrar officials to bring together uh, you know, two very important uh, components in, in looking at this issue. Uh, when you get a chance to read the GAO report, Will you look at this particular provision, provision for the, the recommendation for more dissemination yes. and give us your response to it for the record? Okay. The GAO also recommended that HHS develops uh, statistics for each state, estimating the costs and savings of making Medicaid available for all pregnant women with income of, at 100% of the poverty line or below. Uh, the GAO thinks that would encourage more states to take advantage of that option. Dr. Helms, would you support that recommendation? Well, let me say that uh, I think I have not looked at the GAO report, and neither has the department in any detail. Uh, we will certainly look at that suggestion, as we will all the others, and we will be responding, as we always do, the GAO reports. And will you submit that, the response to that recommendation to the subcommittee, please? I, you know, I see no reason not to, yeah. I don't either. Thank you. Uh, your preliminary 1986 infant mortality statistics put the United States in 13th place among 20 industrialized countries rather than tied for last place, as several witnesses have said. Either is unacceptable as far as I'm concerned, but is the new ranking a comparison of 1986 statistics for all 20 countries? It should have been 17. Well, would you, uh, if you know the information? He said, he said it should have read 17th. Uh, it's, it's 17th. And that, in, that and, means And that we would agree that that is unacceptable. I think that the Secretary is so stated, and I think that's in my testimony, too. Well, so, that, uh, so that if it's 17th, it, it is still tied for last place. Is that right? Well. Yes, that, that's the answer. Tied for last place out of Above, what? Out of the top 20. Yeah, if, you limit the, if you limit the list to uh, uh, your definition of industrialized countries so there are only 17 or 18, I 20, suppose. Yeah. 20 industrialized countries. We had the same information as of 1980. And uh, I, I, I thought that you had found uh, something new that when you said that it was 13th, but, uh, but uh, apparently not. It's still the same position. Yeah, hasn't, hasn't changed, right. Okay. Well, that concludes my questions. Uh, if you have anything further to add by way of summary, I would welcome it. Uh, I must tell you that uh, for people who are concerned about the quality of prenatal care, and about the infant mortality rate and the problems of pregnant women and newly born infants who don't receive sufficient prenatal care. Uh, my impression and conclusion is that the administration has at best been marking time and in fact the statistics indicate that we've been falling further and further behind. And I don't think that you ought to be satisfied any more than I am with, the, with the, the conditions well, that we find today. Let me respond by saying I don't think the Secretary or any of the rest of us are satisfied. And it, I think the Secretary came in two years ago, established this as a major concern, and I do think we're making some progress. Well, Dr. Helms, I appreciate that the Secretary came in two years ago. The administration came in seven years ago. And I don't think that it is possible for, for the administration to pretend that, in fact, it started dealing with the problem only two years ago. It started dealing with the problem seven years ago. Any further comments? If not, again, I want to thank you very much for your presence and participation. Uh, we will keep the record open so that you can submit uh, the responses to the questions that we've asked and also for additional written questions that may come either from the subcommittee or from indi individual members thereof. Thank you very, very much. The subcommittee now stands adjourned, subject to the call of the chair.
You've been watching a House Human Resources subcommittee hearing focusing on prenatal infant care. Join us this Friday afternoon, beginning at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time, for the remarks of Congressman Dan Rostenkowski of Illinois, the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, before a meeting of the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. A House member since 1959, Congressman Rostenkowski reflects on his career and examines changes in Congress's decision-making process over his 29-year career. That's Congressman Dan Rostenkowski this Friday at 3.30 p.m. 12.30 p.m. Pacific here on C-SPAN. The C-SPAN update recaps the news through the words of C-SPAN call-in guests. Here's how. Colin Page is there to document.